walking aids, and look at the patient's shoes, especially noting ankle supports, or orthoses, scuffing, which would suggest a foot drop. Look for clues of reduced manual dexterity, suggesting a distal motor neuropathy for example slip on shoes, difficulty with laces, and absence of buttons on clothes. In the second step, examining the peripheral neuropathy, the skin may be dry, thin, atrophic, hypopigmented, and there may be loss of hair. Look for callosities and ulcer formation. Autonomic involvement may cause the limbs to appear warm, red, and swollen or they may be pale and cold due to abnormal regulation of small blood vessels. Moreover, palpate the peripheral nerves to look for nerve thickening, especially the ulnar nerve at the elbow, the common peroneal nerve at the knee, and the superficial peroneal nerve on the dorsum of the foot. In the third step, look for neuropathic joints, Charcot's joints, swollen, deformed joints, with abnormal ranges of movement, and suggest loss of pain and proprioception. There may be marcrepidus. Any joint can be affected, but the ankle and elbow joints are more commonly affected. In the fourth step, look for evidence of a motor neuropathy will manifest as a lower motor neuron pattern of weakness with wasting, weakness, hyporeflexia, and downdoing planters. In most cases, there is wasting and weakness in a distal to proximal gradient, consistent with a length-dependent axonal degeneration. The longest motor fibers are affected first, and weakness begins in the toes and feet. As the polyneuropathy progresses, it ascends up the lower extremities. When the wasting and weakness reaches the levels of the knees, motor involvement of the hands will be seen, and the length-dependent process then begins in the upper limbs. Places to check for wasting are the first dorsal interossei, loss of bulk between thumb and first finger, and tibialis anterior. Look for wasting of the small muscles of the hands with dorsal guttering, and for hyperextension deformities at the MCP joints and flexion deformities at the interphalangeal joints. In the fifth step, look for evidence of tendon reflexes, are usually reduced or absent in a distal to proximal pattern of involvement, with the lower limbs affected more than the upper limbs. In small fiber neuropathy, large sensory afferents from muscle spindles are relatively preserved and the tendon reflexes may thus remain intact. In the next step, look for evidence of sensory loss manifests in a stocking distribution in the legs and a glove distribution in the arms. In most generalized polyneuropathies, sensory symptoms begin in the most distal part of the longest sensory fibers, that is in the toes and feet. As the disease progresses, sensory loss ascends the lower extremities, typically in a symmetric fashion. When the sensory loss is at or above the level of the knee, the distal fingertips become involved and the length-dependent process then begins in the upper limbs. Remember, not all modalities of sensation may be lost. If only pain and temperature sensation is lost with preservation of light touch, vibration, and joint position sense, this suggests a small fiber neuropathy. However, if only joint position and vibration sense is lost with preservation of pain and temperature, this suggests a large fiber neuropathy. In the last, look for evidence of a high steppage gait, reflex, loss of joint position sense at the ankles due to sensory neuropathy or foot drop caused by motor neuropathy. A sensory gait is wide-based and the patients often watch the feet and ground carefully as they walk with visual input, compensating for loss of joint position sense. As a result, if they stand with their feet together and close their eyes, thereby removing visual input, they become unsteady. This is a positive Romberg's test.